I don't think it's the water. I think I used to be able to get through an entire song without coughing, but it doesn't happen anymore. I apologize for that. I want to start by making a note about uh, pronunciations. You know, you're gonna, you said one word, and I'm going to say it slightly different. But my professor in seminary said, if you don't know how to pronounce something in the Bible, say it as fast as you can, and whatever comes out is right. <laughs> so I talk in terms of King Uzziah. And just a bit of historical background, that was 740 years before Christ that King Uzziah died. By contrast, Jeremiah heard his call 113 years later at 627. I know that gets confusing when you have the numbers go down, but that's what happens before Christ. <clears throat> we started with uh, Nicodemus talking about being born again and being, perhaps that means being childlike before God and not really full of ourselves. Um, and we're talking about how to get messages out. King Uzziah died, and then uh, Isaiah had a call. Jer Jeremiah died. Let me read that right now from Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before, I, before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm just a kid. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I'm just a kid. You must go to everyone I send you to and say, whatever I command you, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. When the Lord reached out, his, then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. You notice that last set of lines are actions. To uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. They are actions. <clears throat> and I remember being a younger man and I never would have guessed that I would stand in front of you as a pastor. Because I didn't want to do all that talking. But one of the things I think our passage for us today tells us is it isn't just talking, it's actions. Actions are stronger than words. <clears throat> Isaiah has that moment when he is confronted by God and he feels inadequate and yet somehow an angel, boy, can you imagine that, a coal being put to his lips? Okay, now you're clean, you can say what you need to say. Here am I, send me. You see, it's action. There's words that go with it, but for Isaiah, the action is, I'm going. I think about actions and I think about words. <clears throat> when I was a teenager and thought I had a lot of money, I bought a horse. Shouldn't have bought it. <laughs> Charlie. <clears throat> Charlie was... I was told green broke, and I didn't know what green broke meant. <laughs> Actually, he was pretty well trained, but he had a hard mouth, and he liked to take the bit in his teeth, and he would find little excuses when we were riding around to just jump and run. <laughs> he was difficult to handle. There were other elements of him that were endearing of him, because I could, uh, I remember one time stopping to see a classmate, and I didn't know what to do because there was no place to tie the reins, so I dropped the reins and went and knocked on the door, and he stayed there, never moved. He had been taught you don't move because you'll step on the reins. They call it being 
ground tied. But other ways he was difficult. And yet I kept him in a lot with electric fence. And there was a spot where I, I had to take him out twice a day to, put, uh, to get, get him to water. And he had to go under this electric fence, and if he raised his head, you know, he was a spooky horse. If he raised his head, he'd hit the electric fence. So somehow I was dumb enough to put my hand on his head, and he was dumb enough to go like this and lower his head and go under the fence, and we did that for years. He trusted me enough. He knew my actions well enough to know that if I put my hand on his head, I was going to keep him from being electrocuted. Actions and not words. <clears throat> when I had cattle out uh, Deep River, Iowa, some time I'll try to explain to you where that is. I didn't know there was a deep river until I wound up living there. I had cattle and I had put them in different uh, places that people had abandoned houses and farmsteads and things. And uh, it worked well. I put an electric fence around places and keep them in, except right about the time that deer season happened. Because the deer didn't know about electric fences and they'd come roaring through and then my cattle would get out. And I don't remember where I was. I was doing something. I had to have multiple jobs. And I got this phone call from my wife. The cows are out on Roger's place. I tried to get them in. I can't get them in. They're in the corn. I don't know what we're going to do. Now, you have to understand, I fed my cows every day with pellets, gluten pellets, for those of you that know what that is. And my cows were used to that every day so Ann had been hurrying through the corn trying to find them and trying to get them back and she gave up and I showed up with my car and a bucket of pellets and I called out come boss and all four cows came running to the fence and followed me along the fence to the gate and then followed me home about a half mile in through the gate and up to the bunk I got done and Ann just looked at me and said, you're a cow whisperer. <laughs> Actions, not words. Now in my younger days, I spent a lot of time saying unprintable things to cows. You know, I talked to them in, in ways that I didn't want the neighbors to hear. And you know, the more you yelled at them, the less they understood. But they understood the words. Every one of us, no matter what, have been drafted by God. That call of Isaiah, that call of Jeremiah, yeah, that's in, the, that's in the Old Testament, but that's for you and me too. We are called. We've been drafted into the army of God, and there are millions in America today who turn away or run away, but all of us have been drafted. God has a claim on each person. It doesn't mean we're always right or even smart, but God as our creator has a claim on us. Now that claim doesn't mean that we all must preach. Actions speak louder than words. And I can tell you now that I can remember individuals in my early church life when I don't remember the teacher that taught me Sunday school. But I remember those individuals who, by their actions, showed me that they knew who I was and cared. There are children who do a better job of proclaiming the love of Christ than their parents. Would you believe that? Some adults have turned away from Christ. Others are so busy judging their brothers and sisters they drive people away from Christ. The claim is to serve Christ. And it's not that we all preach. 
Our salvation came out because someone before us answered the call. There's a certain amount of who I am is because of Katie Wade. Katie was an Athabascan Indian woman. I learned to care because she cared for me. She wasn't my Sunday school teacher. She was a friend of my mom and dad. I gotta tell you about the first time mom and dad met her, they walked into what's called the Church of the Thousand Trees in Palmer, Alaska, a law Presbyterian church. They walked into that thing and uh, they were good Methodists or whatever, they went to the back seat to sit down. And there was Katie Wade with her entire family, a big brood of children, and she moved over to make room for them and the woman in front said, come sit with us, dear. She's Indian, you know. Which is guaranteed to make my mom sit there with Katie. <laughs> There's another friend of mine that made a difference in my life. He was in my class, actually. I met him in sixth grade, Bob Cook. I remember going to, I think it was a music contest. And I don't know whether I was playing the tuba or singing, but I went to this music contest, and as, as you do all the music contests, you have periods of time when you have to sit. And so I was sitting by myself in the room where all the instruments were, playing solitaire, and when I got stuck, I'd move a card or two or three. <laughs> And Bob came in the door just as I was finishing up, and he said, oh, you won! And I said, oh, I cheated a little bit. And I've never forgotten Bob's words. Well, if I have to cheat myself, I'm just going to quit. I haven't cheated at solitaire since. Bob was one of those people. He was going to seminary when he ran into a semi that crossed the median and died. He died about the time Ann and I were married. Salvation can come because someone before us answered the call. Katie Wade, Bob Cook, others. God's purpose in drafting us is salvation of others, not punishment. And you wouldn't know that to listen to some people. There's a man I've talked with, and when I admitted, you know, I walked by his house all the time. And when I admitted that I had entered the ministry, he would gleefully talk about all the terrible things that were going to happen to unbelievers, because the end times are almost here. Has anybody ever heard that kind of talk? Any of us ever try that kind of talk? Just me? <laughs> he would talk gleefully and eloquently about the end times and the destruction of all the people who haven't accepted Christ as the end times began. And I was uncomfortable about the second time. I was uncomfortable with this gleeful, oh boy, those people are going to get it. And I finally realized why I was uncomfortable with his joy at the destruction of millions. Jesus warned us of the consequences of not being prepared, but he didn't gleefully announce how people were going to hell. Have you noticed that? He wasn't happy about it. God's purpose is salvation, not sending people to hell. God's purpose is to warn us and get us to change. The Gospel of John, those words, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It isn't about punishment. It's about saving people. And God's call for you and I doesn't ever end. My suspicion is when we get to the golden streets, we'll be given jobs, things to do. 
maybe singing in the choir, maybe, I don't know, do they need to sweep up? You know, the job of Savior is already taken. Ultimately, our actions speak louder than our words. People talk about how in this country, the church has a bad reputation now. And it's because of the judgmentalism that we have and the people who act hateful. It's notable. I remember one time in a story of a, a news story about an Amish family that lost, I don't know if it was a son or a daughter. And the news people were just in awe of the fact that those Amish people didn't hate. They were so filled with love and all they could talk about was this other person who had been killed in the process and his parents must be suffering too. If we acted like those Amish people, if we were filled with love and our actions spoke of Christ in everything we did, this church wouldn't be half empty. Many churches would not be half empty. I talked about the horse and the cows, Native American woman and my friend Bob. It's all about actions. We can say a few words while we're at it. But it's our actions that people watch. Isaiah, listen to God say, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And he said, here am I, send me.